When I was preparing for this talk, I was kind of thinking, how should I start the presentation? Should I go with, hi, my name is Zainab Maleki, and I'm privileged to be here. And it kind of hit me in the head that I am privileged to be here. With everything that is going around the world, whether you guys know about it or not, Iranian women are fighting for their freedom, are fighting to choose what they want to wear for very basic human rights. Afghan girls are getting bombed in school. So I do very, feel very privileged. I was able to go and study and work, and I was able to attend one of the biggest tech conferences in the world. And I'll not only attend, but also have my waist head. So here it goes. Hello, everyone. My name is Zainab Maleki, and I am truly privileged to be here. A bit of background about myself. I am a technical lead at a consultancy firm called Mechanical Rock. We're also one of the AWS advanced partners. I've done eight years of software engineering in total, done a variety of work, including building front-end application, back-end applications, some infrastructure as code, DevOps and automation, and some SRE work. But in the past two to three years, I've mainly been involved in data projects. And that's why I'm here today. I'm going to talk about my experience of coming from a software engineering background into data engineering, things that I've seen and it shocked me, and kind of things that I think we can learn from software engineering world and bring it into our data engineering. So the agenda today is I'm going to talk about how to move fast with your data. That's the whole topic of today. What are the things that we're doing today that is stopping us and preventing us from moving fast? And how do we avoid it? How, what are the strategies that we can take to be able to move fast? And then I'm going to talk about Dora metrics. What, is the, what are Dora metrics? How do they help software delivery team? What can we do to bring those into data engineering? And I'll show you a path to success. It will be my demo. It's not perfect. It's not production-ready demo. It's a demo. But it will show you a glimpse of possibilities of what you can do using tools such as AWS Service Catalog and other AWS services to show you what success could look like. And then at the end, I'll close it with small wins. What are the things that you can do today, taking out of your, this talk, to help you to move fast with your data and have better operational excellence. <clears throat> this is my motto. I always say, when I'm developing an application, I want to be able to move fast. I want to move fast, I want to develop fast, and I want to move with confidence. Because you don't want to keep going fast and falling apart. You want to go fast, and you want to go fast with confidence. I want to leave a legacy after this consultant is leaving our company. Nothing is going to break. Everything is not going to fall apart. I want to move with confidence that the application that I'm building and leaving, it's maintainable. I always say this to my clients. You have to think of it as building a software application when you're dealing with your data. Because it's not different. In my mind, it's the same thing. What do you do when you're building a software application? You write functions. You give it input, and then it gives you an output. Your business logic is in the middle. Same thing in data. You write your transformation scripts. That's your business logic. You give it input data and an output. Then you deploy it and test it and maintain it. Same thing in software, same thing in data. But I also contradict myself. And I say it's not the same thing. There are differences that you need to be aware and you need to understand. And the main difference in my brain is that our data is often in the middle. We have a lot of consumers. We have our business users consuming the data that we generate. We have our reports consuming the data that we generate. We have our machine learning models consuming the data that we generate. We have our applications, internal or third-party applications, consuming the data that we generate. And therefore, it's very costly to make mistakes. 
When you make mistakes in building an application, if you create a bug, it goes all the way to production. Let's say we do all good practices, trunk-based development, small changes all the way to production, and it breaks something. What do you do? You revert your change, right? Easy, and it goes back to healthy. Versus in data, you make a mistake. You change your transformation, it generates bad data silently. Then after seven days, you figure it out. You go to your CEO and knock his door and say, hey, that report that I sent to you seven days ago, it was wrong. I made a mistake in my transformation. This is a new one. We didn't make money, we lost money. Do the same thing to your machine learning model. Go and say, hey model, whatever you've learned in the past seven days, unlearn it, learn this new data. How do you even do that? Maybe you can, I'm not a data scientist. What I'm trying to say, it is very, very difficult to clean bad data. And therefore, testing is way more important than you think when you're dealing with your data. The way that I was building software applications, we do a lot of testing. Like my company started as a testing company, and then we became a software engineering company. So we write unit testing, automation, integration testing, a lot of different layers. When I came to data, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to start writing integration testing, unit testing. I was Googling my ways around how do you actually do that. And I was really shocked. All I was seeing was data quality checks. What are data quality checks? They check the quality of your data. For example, this is specific column, it's unique. Or this other specific column, the data coming to it matches this regex. Don't get me wrong, it's great that we have it, but it's not enough. In order for you to be able to go fast and to have enough confidence that whatever you build, it's behaving exactly as you expected, it's not enough to just write data quality checks. You will need complex layers of testing. Who's heard of Dora? Raise your hand. Awesome, a few people, that's great. Dora, through six years of research, the research, DevOps research and assessment team, backed by Google, they call themselves Dora, they have identified four key metrics that indicates the performance of a software delivery team. What are those key metrics? Deployment frequency. How often do you deploy to production? Do you deploy once a day, multiple times a day, once a week, once a month? Lead time for a change. From the time that you commit your change till you push it through different environments, till you run it through all of your testing, until it's in production, this whole process is called your lead time. Change failure rate. How often does the change that you push create failure? You push two changes, one of them fails. Your fail ch change failure rate is 50%. And time to restore. From the time something goes wrong, until you figure out, until you know where it's gone wrong, until you push a fix, this whole process, it's called time to restore. We want our time to restore to be as little as possible. <coughs> Deployment frequency. Dora team, they say, you're an elite team if you deploy multiple times per day. You're a high-performing team if you deploy between once a day to once a week. Who here thinks their data team are elite team? Raise your hand if you believe you have elite data team in your organization. Okay, a few people. Keep your hands up. If you agree, the lead time for a change for your data team is less than an hour. So if you wanna add a new ingestion, so it takes you less than an hour to push it all the way to production. Keep your hands up. 
if your change failure rate is less than 15%. So the data pipelines that you develop, it's very stable. It doesn't fall, it doesn't fail all the time. And time to restore service, less than an hour. The only way that time to restore can be less than an hour is if you've got good alerting, good observability, good monitoring, let quick lead time, and then you can restore your service easily. Do I they generate these reports every year? I haven't seen one for this year, but the last one that I've seen is 2021. They call it Accelerate State of DevOps. Basically, they say elite performers, in comparison to low performers, they're 900, they've got 973 times more frequent deployments. 973 times more frequent deployment. That means they deliver faster value to their customers. And 6,570 times faster lead time to production. 6,570 times. And 6,570 times faster to recover from an incident. That's where we all want to be, right? We all want to be an elite team. Why? Because we want to deliver faster value to our customer, because we want whatever we build to be stable and maintainable. We don't want to wake up at night. So how do we become an elite data team? What are the things that are preventing us to have elite data teams? And what are the strategies that help us to get there? In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about five different challenges that I've seen over and over, over around the industry, and five strategies to help you to overcome them. First one is slow moving data platforms. And what do I mean by that? This is literally taken from Data Mesh. Has anyone heard of Data Mesh? Yeah, cool, awesome, a few people. So basically, she mark in Data Mesh, she says that for years we had these analytical platforms that was in the middle. We have all the data producers pushing data into this central place, and we've got consumers accessing data from this central place. But over time, we found out that these analytical platforms, they're not scalable. They were often on-prem servers. They couldn't keep up with demand. They couldn't scale. So what we did was we pushed them in cloud. Cloud is elastic. It's scalable, right? But we still have a slow-moving data platforms. Why is that happening? Because we often manage those platforms within a central team. This team, they're often very gatekeepers of everything going into the platform and everyone accessing the platform. And new data producers that want to push data, they have to go to the central team to make some manual changes. Consumers, they need access to data, they need to go to that central team. And even worse, I've seen it in many places, this central team grabbing their data the data, transforming it, pushing it out. Grabbing new data, transforming it, pushing it out. They do the whole thing. I imagine enterprise scale. What happens when you build something? You have to maintain it, right? And don't tell me it's not going to break. Don't tell me it's not going to fall. Because it does. Because our systems are evolving. Because our data are evolving. Whatever we build, it will need someone to look after. So what happens is usually this central data team, they're often firefighting. Of all the things that they have to do, they have to build and maintain. And all the new demands that they get and consumer demands. So it's not scalable. And that's why we have slow moving data platforms. What do we need to do? We need to start decentralizing our data teams. And that's what Data Mesh talks about. Data Mesh says, or 
from, I don't know if you guys have re read this other book, Data Management and Scale, both of these books, I highly recommend it. But they both talk about the same thing, domain-driven data design. So basically, they say each of the domains, they look after their own data. They ingest their own data, they process their own data, they publish their own data. Another domain doing the same thing. You build it, you run it, you maintain it, you also take care of your own data. It's not someone else's responsibility. But it doesn't mean that each of the domains, they can create a mess. And we give them admin access in the data platforms, they can do whatever they want to. We need some consistency. We want consistent access layers. There are things in the platform that we want to maintain. And how do we do those? By separating roles and responsibilities between what a domain does, what a platform team does. This is from data mesh architecture. If you see the middle, it shows you the responsibility of the domain. Domain is in the middle. They look after their own data, they create data products, that's the middle. The bottom part is the data platform. Data platform, they look after policy automation, they look after storage and compute layer, they look after cataloging and access management and monitoring of the platform. And how do they do that? If you look at the bottom, it's a self-serve data platform. So it's not manually by people looking after those things. So looking at the roles and responsibilities in details. Platform teams, their main job should be enabling the domains. Enabling the domains to be able to do what they need to do. Looking after platform security, all back, access controls. Centralized access layers that all the consumers, when they want to grab data, they go to the same place with the same approach to access data. Doesn't matter where in the organization is generating that data. Platform consistency, auditing, and building templates. Keep this one in mind. I'm going to talk about building templates a bit later. But domain responsibility is ingestion, transformation, serving their data, observability of their own data pipelines, automated testing on it, and data masking. And the only way to remove the dependency between platform team and domain teams is by creating this self-service platform, as I said. Because all the domains, they still need to go to the platform team to be able to get started. So coupling and dependency means slowness. We don't want to go slow. We want to go fast. The only way to do that is building, building fully automated self-service data platform. But there is a main issue that I see is often we don't have enough capability within data platform teams. We have a lot of awesome data engineers, but not enough DevOps engineers, not enough automation capabilities. And that's where we need to start combining our skill sets. I'm not a data engineer, I'm a software engineer, I'm a DevOps engineer, but when I go to data platform teams, we learn from each other. I teach them DevOps engineering and automation, they teach me data engineering. It works. Another challenge, slow platform adoption. We're gonna change everything. We're gonna tell the domains to look after their own data, do their own, maintain their own data. But they don't want to do it. They don't want to take more responsibilities. They're like, we don't have that own engineering capability. We don't want to do it. So how do we encourage them to start taking that responsibility? And that's one of the biggest challenges with data mesh. By automating domain capabilities, to allow easy adoption. Remember the thing that I said about building templates? One of the platform responsibility is building automated templates. And 
This is one of their templates. Now imagine a new domain. They want to get started. They want to get started into the platform. They go to the self-service platform. They enter the details. And then everything is ready for them. Everything that they need inside the data platform, all the resources, all the RBAC is already set up. They also get a GitHub repository with connected CI CD built into it with transformation patterns and practices, with testing patterns and practices, with observability included. Template is all ready for them to go. Ta da! It's magic. Now, all they need to do is changing their SQL. Changing their SQL transformation and then start looking after their own data. But all the scaffolding is done. Heavy lifting is done for them. And that's what we want. Another challenge point, overprotective data teams. Honestly, this is hilarious. I've seen it in one place. They were trying to go with data mesh approach with domain-driven design. And then per domain, they create all these environments. They create dev environment, test environment, UAT, pre-prod, God knows what. And then they don't give anyone access to any of the environments. They just give access to prod. I was like, why do you even do that? They're like, oh, because we're scared of them pushing prod data into non-prod environments. I was like, what? <laughs> How can you stop people from being dumb? If people want to be dumb, they can be dumb. If they want to be stupid and do stupid things, they can. What is important is you look after what you can control. You can't control everything. You can't stop people doing the wrong thing. But what you can do is to detect it and then, then take actions on it. And the only way to do that is by building security and data discoverability within the platform. I'm going to show you in my demo what do I mean by this. I'll go through more details. But basically, when you're setting up the domains, you set up all the predefined roles and access controls. You don't need custom roles. We don't need to create them later. Everything is already pre-set up according to an approved RBAC design. And then data discoverability is already taken care of because all the roles, they have access to all the data. We need to change our mindset of how we look at, how we, how we look at our security. Instead of hiding everything, you open everything. Unless it's been identified as sensitive. Everyone has access to everything unless it's been identified as sensitive. You may think, it's not possible. We, we don't want to leave our data open and open the risk of data breach. Well, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you to jeopardize security. I'm asking you to change your mindset. Look at it from detective approach versus protective. Instead of hiding your data, leave your data open. From the start, if a new domain comes on board, they ingest new data, it looks like sensitive, but they haven't tagged it or identified it as sensitive, your compliance test will find it and it will hide it. It will drop those data, it will hide it and send an alert to them. You push sensitive data, your data is gone. So you're encouraging good behaviors from the start by having good compliance testing to look after your security. Last failure point. I, I did this talk at Melbourne conference at a data engineering conference, and everyone literally after the talk, they came to me and they said, like, we've also got this cluster of mess. It's very common if you've seen it as well. This is an example of it. We've got Amazon Aurora in that side as our source database. And then we've got our DMS pulling data down into S3 bucket. At some point, we thought Cloudera was a good thing, so we pushed it in there. We're going to have a data lake. And then there is a glue job doing some transformation, pushing it to Redshift. In the past, we also had Matillion. God knows what it does, but we're scared of removing it. 
because we don't know who uses it. And then we did a proof of concept on Databricks. We had Databricks and then DBT running an ECS cluster that keeps running out of memory, but don't you worry, we just click restart. And then that proof of concept, someone needed it, so we just plugged it to our very important report that uses all of these data. I imagine one of these lines break. What happens? You get bad data, right? You get missing data. And then we think our tools are our problems. So what do we do? We come and try something different. You're just like, let's throw all of those away. Tools are our problems. Maybe like Redshift is not good, it's not working, let's put Fivetran in there. Fivetran is a SaaS product, it looks after the infrastructure, I have to do less, so let's do that. Snowflake, another SaaS product, I'll have to do less, so let's do that. And DBT, we'll put it on DBT Cloud this time. But what people don't realize is we added another mess to the mess above. Unless we get rid of what's on the top, we're not ever gonna be in a good spot. And even, I've seen companies with one data platform creating mess. You only have one data platform, you only have one transformation tooling and pattern, you're doing ELT, good practices, but you, we still create mess within that one data platform. And why? Because we don't do it right. Because our tools are not our problems. They can all work. Redshift can exactly work the same way as Snowflake would, exactly the same, same way as Databricks would. They, they all can work if we have proper processes and proper automation around them. And that's why I always say this to my client. Build it once, scrap what you have, start over, but build it once and build it right. Do it right the first time around. And that's where I get into my demo. I'll just switch this over to my laptop quickly. So while that's coming, I'll give you a bit of background. <coughs> Basically, this demo, I'm using AWS Service Catalog. The part that I said about building templates and automated data platforms, that's the part that I want to show you. What does an automated self-serve data platform look like using AWS Service Catalog? I have AWS Service Catalog. Who knows what's AWS Service Catalog, by the way? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, uh, I'll explain it then. Basically, AWS Service Catalog is a product that allows you to build template. And then you package your template, and then you publish it to all of your AWS ac accounts on your organization. So everyone will see the same published product. Then they go and launch that product on their account. So you create templates that could be used in many places. <coughs> so I have an AWS Service Catalog product for automated domain vending. Someone a new domain, they want to get onboarded, they go to this catalog product that is available to them, they enter their details, and ta-da they get everything that they need. Right. I have a repository called Snowflake Governance Framework. And that's where all of my Snowflake governance is being done. All right, by the way, I'm using Snowflake just because I've, I've been more comfortable with it. But all of the Snowflake governance, like all back, access controls, setting up the domains is done through that repository as I'm showing here. And there is a CI CD pipeline using AWS Code Pipeline connected that deploys into Snowflake. Right, apologies for this. Demo God is not on my side. Um, <laughs> but we'll see it there in the talk. Yeah, I'll go through the next slide and see what we can do about the demo. So. <laughs> Good things take time. So far, what we've been talking about is changing team topologies, going with the data mesh approach, asking domains to do their own data engineering, and hiring the more DevOps engineers into data platform teams. A lot of things that if you're a data engineer, you can't do 
is out of your hand. You can probably influence, maybe, but you can't do it. They're big changes, and it takes time. It's not easy. So we're going to talk about small things that you can do today to change your journey. <coughs> One, I don't know if I should say that in an AWS reInvent conference or not, but I've seen so many people being a cowboy, just going into data platforms, running SQL, and doing things. For the love of God, enforce Git, <laughs> please. If you're saying your data teams, they're not using Git or version control, start enforcing that. No one needs to have high privileged access to go and make manual changes into the data platforms. They're not tra traceable. There are a lot of source of our problems where things go wrong, so start using Git and enforcing it. <laughs> Set up automated deployments. It's really easy. I've got a blog post, which in my demo I was showing, copying RSA key but um, it, it takes you less than an hour to set up automated deployment with a thing like Snowflake or Databricks or Redshift. It's super easy to do. Add automated testing for all of your business logics. Data quality checks are not enough. If you're not doing any testing, which is very common and I've seen in many places doing data transformation without any testing, it's time to start. If you're only looking after data quality checks using great expectations, DBT testing, it's good, but it's not awesome. We want to have more confidence in our data. Separate platform administration from data pipelines. So your data pipelines that you build, keep it separate from your RBAC, from your access controls, from your creation of your storage and your compute layers. And then later on, when your organization is ready for a change like data mesh, you can hand over the data pipeline side to the domains. So you, you separate your roles and responsibilities slightly within your code. And start capturing data about health of your data pipelines. The only way to be able to improve is to know where we are today. Things like mean time to recovery. Your data pipelines are running in the background. How often they are failing? How long does it take from a fail scenario to a success? How long does that take in an average? Or mean time between failures. How often they're tripping? If a data pipeline is falling every week or every few days, that means it's not stable. We'll need to do something about it. So start capturing this data, it will help you a long way. And remove your administration <laughs> access. With the love of God, if you're a data engineer or you're working in a data platform, you do not need an administration access. No one does. What it does is a service user connected to your GitHub repository, deploying everything, being peer reviewed properly, and that needs admin access. Not any human being unless for break glass, like a few people in a big enterprise organization, but that's it. And thank you very much. My name is Zainab Maliki, and I'm privileged to be here.